Thank you, worship man, for preparing our hearts through singing back to King Jesus. We praise you, Lord, for putting together a family like this for such a time as now. And we're going to continue worship as we are in the Word of God, John chapter 15, and we are making our way through uh, the uh, farewell discourse through the book of John, and we're going to wrap it up here this summer, and then following uh, this particular sermon series through the Gospel of John, we're going to be doing another series called Prayers for Koa, and then we'll uh, have that for a couple of months. There are going to be certain prayers for our church, for our congregation that we're going to focus on through the Holy Scriptures, and then we're going to do another series in the fall as we seek the Lord's will and the guidance of the Holy Spirit through the inspired Word of God. And what that means is the Bible is relevant to all of life, all of the time for God's people. And so it doesn't matter where you are, as long as the Word of God is preached faithfully it, as far as the uh, Holy Scriptures are concerned. And we're in John 15, 1 and following. And so far in the Gospel of John, we've, we've learned a lot about King Jesus uh, these are snapshots of his life and gospel ministry. And along the way, he said some pretty profound things. And in this particular gospel, he said uh, what's called a lot of I am sayings. And so far, we've covered almost all of them until today. We've covered the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And in the Greek, the word is ego a me. And uh, so if you were to read a Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, now we're geeking out now. Uh, we're, sorry, we're already not even a couple minutes in, we're geeking out. And so that is the Old Testament name of God. So Jesus, for himself, he invokes the name of God for himself. And he says, I am the bread of life in John chapter six. He says, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 8 and John chapter 9, he said, I am the door of the sheep. In John chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd in John 10. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life in John 11. And then in John 14, 6, that famous line, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. And then today, we come to another I am saying. All of these sayings, all of these things, Jesus is saying, I am God incarnate. And if you want to know who God is, you have to look to me. And he says right out of the gates here in John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. These words carry a great deal of significance as we read in the Old Testament. There's a reason we read Psalm 80, which we'll reference here in a moment this morning, so that we could tee up John chapter 15 today. This Old Testament imagery of the vine is, is all over the place. Ancient Israel, as you know, it was an agrarian society. And so there were, there were a lot of there was a lot of farming going on in ancient Israel, and uh, they farmed a lot of grapes. And if you want to have grapes, you got to have a grape vine. And so in the Old Testament, God uses that imagery of, of the vine. And when he uses the imagery of the vine, like we read in Psalm 80, he's actually talking in the Old Testament about Israel. Israel is called the vine. It is the vine of God. And why is it the vine of God? Because God planted it, God tended it, and he expected it to grow fruit. He expected Israel to bear fruit for all of the nations to see that this God is real, that this God is present, and that this God is not silent. This God speaks. Jesus, fast forward several years, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years forward, Jesus shows up and he says, by the way, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. 
and my father is the vine dresser. Some of your versions say husbandman, which is perfectly accurate. In other words, Jesus is showing up and he is saying something so radical that it is going to get him executed. It's going to get him hung on a cross and the Jews and the Romans will be in cohorts together against him. In other words, he's showing up and he's saying, I am the true vine of God and my father is the vine dresser, i.e., I am the true Israel of God. That's what he's saying. It is radical as it sounds. And, and, you know, a lot of evangelicalism, you know, changes over the course of, of the years. And, and we just got to go there. I've got to just address a few things quickly just to show you, because I would be a terrible teacher if I didn't teach the Bible, if I didn't use the Bible to teach you a few things. Uh, I, some of you said, you know, it's a little chilly in here. Would you please warm me up with your sermon? And I said, oh boy, just wait. Just wait. Right out of the gates, it's going to get real warm real fast, and you may get tomatoes and eggs and want to throw them at me. But uh, here, here's, here's where we got to go with this. So much of evangelical, of the evangelical Christian world, unfortunately, sees two programs of salvation. They see a program of salvation for Israel, and they see a program of salvation for the church. You can hear it in their language. You can see it in how they display Christianity. And they really believe that. They believe there are two different programs of Christianity. There's the Israeli version, and then there's the Christian version. That is an 1800s import. That is actually a late development in the history of the church. Jesus shows up in the first century and he says, I am the true vine. Y'all read about the vine in Psalm 80, but I am the true vine. It even references in that Psalm 80, the son of man. Who is the son of man? The son of man is Jesus Christ. And what he's saying here, what Jesus is saying here is that he fulfilled all that was required of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. No wonder they hung him. I mean, if you show up and you're a Jew like him, and he says, by the way, you ain't Israel. I'm Israel. I am the true Israel. I am what you should have been. Now, you're obviously blessed. Paul addresses that in Romans 9. Why are they blessed? They are blessed because they have the oracles of God. Can you imagine growing up in a non-Christian home versus a Christian home? If you grew up in a Christian home, you are incredibly blessed. You are blessed beyond measure because you were told, like I was in vacation Bible school and Sunday school and, you know, our versions of community groups, you were told by your Christian parents the word of God since the womb. I had the oracles of God. Paul, the apostle who is a Jew, addresses that in Romans and says, let me tell you why the Jews were blessed. They had the oracles of God, the law of God. They had God speak to them. They, had, they walked with God. They talked with God. But what did Israel do? They rejected their Messiah. They rejected their Messiah. And so in one sense, Psalm 80 one of the Old Testament passages that uses this vine metaphor, God is calling the people of Israel to do what? To repent, to repent of their sins, to return to the fidelity of the covenant that God established with them. And so that's why the psalmist wrote about the vine. That's why the psalmist talked about the son of man. That son of man who was going to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, here's a verse that's tucked away in the Bible, and it's going to blow your head away. I'm just going to warn you. I'm going to, Kevin, Romans 9, 6, if you got it. It's, it's an elephant gun. Yeah. 
But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Oh boy. In that passage, the Apostle Paul, a Jew, the Jew, the Jew who was rising in the ranks, he goes on and he talks about Jacob and Esau. Same father, same daddy. And God says what? Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Now that's a big horse pill to swallow, isn't it? That may be one of the most difficult verses to preach and to interpret in all of scripture. See, something has crept in to the church and something has crept in to ancient Israel. Your blood doesn't save you. But I thought God made a covenant with Israel that he's going to fulfill. Yes, he did. And God, according to the book of Romans, is not slow to answer his promises. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1, 19 to 20, all scripture has its yes and its amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. He fulfilled it. He fulfilled it. I can see your heads are exploding right now. Oh, you're mad at me. Paul also answers the question in Galatians chapter three, verse seven. Who is it that are the children of Abraham who preceded Moses? Remember that Abraham, he said, I'm gonna make your seed as numerous as the sands of the beach and the stars of the sky. Paul begs the question, he says, who are are the sons of Abraham? Who are they? And he's saying this, it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Just a direct quote, black and white. Look it up in the Greek. Look it up in the English. Look it up in the Dutch. Look it up in Mandarin. Am I trying to be a smart aleck? No. What I'm trying to show you and what I've been preaching for years is that the glory of God is made manifest in the face of Jesus Christ. And he is not going to be robbed of his glory. He is not going to be robbed of his glory. What this is saying, it's called the scandal of the cross. It is the scandal of the cross. What this is saying is that, let's do a poll. How many of you are Jewish? How many of you are afraid to, you know, not afraid to admit it right now? If you're Jewish, we love you. The Bible says to pray for Israel and we will pray for Israel. But there are not a lot of Jewish people here today. I see some Hispanics. I see some Asian folks. I see some uh, white folks. What this means is that if you are in Jesus Christ, you are a son or daughter of Abraham and therefore Moses and Isaac and Jacob and therefore you are more Jewish than most Jews. Wow. Now they're ready to fire me. This is not something that's meant to hurt. This is not something that is meant to be mean. The psalmist, as well as John the Apostle, who's Jewish, by the way, they are calling us to repent and to believe and be attached to the true vine of Israel, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will not be robbed of his glory. The psalmist first calls for God to return to his people. Did you see that in Psalm 80 when Kevin was, he was saying, please return to us. Please return to us. Please return to us. Restore to us. Restore to us. Restore to us. And hundreds of years later, This Jewish carpenter shows up named Jesus from Nazareth 
And John the Apostle said what? And we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The vine has indeed showed up. And his name is Jesus. And here's what John says about, about this. In John chapter 1. But to all who did receive him. Who is him? I know that's bad English. But who is him? Jesus Christ. Who believed in his name. Who is that? Jesus. He, that's God, gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Your blood doesn't save you. It never saved you. It never saved you. You see, they had that birthright. They had that Jewish birthright, didn't they? And man, they were so close to God. But sometimes you can be so close to God, you miss it. Because what happens is, as I said before, people in the South, especially in the United States, we have just enough Jesus to be inoculated against him like a vaccine. We got just enough to be inoculated. Uh, remember the COVID shot? Remember that? We got just enough Jesus to be inoculated against him. Just like them. The more things change, the more they stay the same. It's true. So Jesus shows up and he says, I am the true vine. I am the son of man. And see, that what's beautiful about this is the father is the vine dresser. He owned the vineyard. It is God's vineyard. And, and was, it, God was responsible for the care. Some of you are great. Some of you got a green thumb. And y'all are great agrarians. And you could, you know, you could just throw a seed in the ground and there's like 45 tomatoes. The rest of us, we throw it in the ground and it kills it. I tell my in-laws, you know, I say, listen, I'm a better fisher of men than fish. I can guarantee you that. I cannot catch fish. I catch a lot of rocks in that river. But the father is the vine dresser. He is dressing up. He is taking care of the field. He is nurturing the field, and ultimately the productivity of the field belongs to God the Father through Jesus the Son. Christ was the vine because he was the fulfillment of Israel. Some people will tell you, they'll say, oh, that sounds like replacement theology. The church is replacing the church. That is tomfoolery. That is ridiculous. You believe the church replaces Israel? No, no. We believe in fulfillment theology. Jesus Christ fulfilled all that he was to do. And therefore, we are the branch that is grafted on to Israel, the church. That's uh, what a beautiful picture of God's plan for the world. And so here's, let me, let me do a little side note. I got to give you a free one. So here's the deal. Mm -mm -mm. This is not good. So right now, in the news, Pastor Hat coming on, as if I haven't been pastoring right here. Pastor Hat going on right here. Right now, this, this, this Hamas thing and these protesters and the Israeli thing going on and all that, 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 that. Here's what's crazy about that. The Bible says that we are to pray for Israel. But what are we actually to pray for them for? We are to pray for the same things that you would pray for. The safety of Israel. The glory of Israel. The may there be no more wars and fights and blah, blah, blah. But what are we really to pray for? Their salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. May they receive their Savior. Now, I personally believe you're going to know the end is near because you're going to see a whole lot of Jews start coming to Jesus Christ. And you're going to be like, it's got to be close. <laughs> I mean, there are Jews everywhere coming to Jesus Christ. And by the way, there are about 15 million Jews. Nine Jews, nine million in Israel, about seven million in the United States. 
So what are we to make of all this stuff? I, I want you to think clearly and biblically and sober-mindedly. So I don't know if you pay attention much to the news. Some of you pay too much attention to the news. And you talk about it on Facebook. I'm a Facebook stalker, by the way. So right now, you're having these protests, which is very interesting and peculiar. But the House just tried to push something through recently. And I don't know if you've been keeping up with the language, but the House just tried to pass a, a resolution, if you will, against anti-Semitism. Now, is the church, are we, are we for that? Are we, absolutely. We are for, you know, Israel. We, we do not want any hatred coming towards Israel. But do you know what was slipped in? Do you know what was slipped in? Hate speech. If a preacher like me says that the Jews and the Romans were responsible for the execution of Jesus, I could be liable for a crime. Hmm. It's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting as a Christian who believes that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, is now getting shot from both sides. The exact same thing that happened in the first century. That was an overreach. That was an overcorrection by our government trying to fight back anti-Semitism. And now they're throwing the Christians under the bus if we say that Jews executed them. Well, Pastor Barry, I saw a girl on Twitter, you know. I'm on Twitter, by the way. I'm a stalker. I'm on Twitter. And I saw a girl, girl say, you know, but you, you know, but technically Jews didn't execute Jesus, you know you know, uh, the Romans did because that was their form of execution. I'd like you to ask Stephen how he felt when they stoned him to death. They were at least complicit in the execution of Jesus. That's why the Apostle Peter, when at Pentecost, can preach to 3,000 people and say, by the way, it was predestined before the foundation of the world that Jesus would die on the cross, but by the way, it's your fault. You all got together against him. So Christian, you, you have to think sober-mindedly. That doesn't make me smarter than you. That doesn't make me better than you, but know what you're voting for. This, this is when you call your senators and you say, don't vote for that. Don't vote for that because now you're throwing every Christian minister in the country under the bus because you just included all of us as being anti-Semitic. We couldn't be pro, more pro-Jew than anybody else in the world. Our savior is Jewish. The savior of the world is Jewish. So we, we've got to start thinking clearly and not just latch on to the emotion of the moment. The, the reality is this. If you stand up for Jesus as the Lord God, Messiah, Son of God, Son of Man, you will be shot from both sides. But there's nothing more glorious than standing up for King Jesus, who said, if you are not afraid to profess me before the world, I am not afraid to profess you before my Father. Welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. That is the position of the church. Do we believe in self-defense? Absolutely. Do we believe in just war theory according to Romans 13, 16, you name it? Absolutely. Everybody should have a right to defend their own family. But be careful what you vote for. Be careful how you think as a Christian. There, that was a massive, massive overreach by our Congress. And so it's my job as a shepherd to warn you about that. And to say, be sober-minded and think about it. Enough of the rant. You ready for more? Some of you are steaming mad. Oh, man. I got wrestling signs. Watch out. They will defend me. Bible says in verse 2, every branch 
in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. As Christians, as his disciples, you know, we are to be fruitful and be productive. You know, I hear a lot of times where people just kind of, after they get saved, they just kind of sit on their backside and don't do anything for the Lord. And, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer would have called that cheap grace. He would have, he would have said, the grace of Christ is so costly that it demands my life, that I lay down my life for him. And so as Christians, do we, do we just kind of sit back and wait? That's what the Thessalonians did. Remember the Thessalonians? They were looking at the sky for the rapture. It's hilarious. To me, it's funny. And we can laugh because they're dead. They don't, they, don't, they don't know. They don't know we're laughing at them. But it's funny. They quit their jobs. They literally were looking for like the blood moons and the rapture attack. I call it rapture attack. And if you get the mark of the beast card, you lose. You know, it's, 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 they quit their jobs. And Paul said, what are you doing? Don't, don't quit your jobs. You got to keep working. You got to keep making disciples. You got to keep, you know, grinding as the kids say in sports. You got to keep working, man. You know, you got to keep reaching people, making disciples, reaching the nations. You can't just get your lawn chair out like every day is an eclipse day and put your glasses on and just drink your tea and just complain about everything in the world. You got to get busy. You got to get active. And so there's an old saying here, we must see that while we are justified by faith, apart from works, we are justified by faith unto works. Let me say it again. While we are justified by faith, apart from works, we are justified by faith unto works. That, that faith in Jesus causes you to work, to get active, Capitalism didn't, didn't, capitalism, and you know my favorite movie is Rocky IV, so don't you dare say I hate my country. My dad served in the military, military police. You know, I was about to be in the Navy as a lieutenant commander, then my little kidney stones sent me here to start this church. But anyway, <laughs> that's just the way it works. I love this country, but capitalism didn't invent hard work. God did. God did. God said in the garden that you're going to work. You're going to till. And then here come the weeds after sin. You know, that's why you hate work. Because of sin and the curse. And so working is a mandate of Christ. But, but, but what he's saying here in verse, verses 3, 4, and 5. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you guys. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. The same spirit that wrought Regeneration in your heart is the same one who's going to sanctify you. You, you. you say, Pastor Barry, I don't have the willpower. I don't have the, the, the stuff, the moxie, the, the skills, the giftings, you know. I know you don't, neither do I. But that's why he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. We don't do it in our own power. We do it in his power. We don't do it in our own wisdom and strength. We do it in his strength. You ever tried to fix your life? You've ever tried to fix a bad situation in your life? You often make it worse, right? You try to manipulate the controls of your life and then you do it outside the power of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and boom, everything's messed up. Jesus knows that and he says, apart from me, you can do nothing, but in him, you can bear much fruit. Now, this certainly means the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, but this actually happened before the book of Galatians. So it actually means a broader, there's a broader definition of fruit here. It's all that the Lord would have you to do according to his will. The Bible talks about the silversmith. The Bible talks about carpenters. The Bible talks, you know, Luke is a doctor, by the way. And so the fruit of the Spirit is that Galatians 5.22 list. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. 
All those things. Did I leave one out? One of you will let me know after I know. So it's a broader thing. Whatever the Lord have you to do. If you are to be a faithful teacher in Christ, be a faithful teacher. Faithful mama, faithful leader, faithful accountant, faithful doctor, faithful, you name it. He's got all kinds of things for us to do in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he gives us a warning here. And he says, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. So, so in the Greek, that's in verse 2, that's a little bit of a play on words. So the word is uh, ario, and that means to be cut off. But those who bear fruit, they receive cathario, which that's where we get our word catharsis from, which means a cleansing, a cleansing, a pruning. So there's a little bit of a play on words here. In other words, God is saying, everybody is going to get cut one way or another. You're either going to get cut off or you're going to get pruned. If you are in Christ, you will be pruned and bear much fruit. <clears throat> You'll be purified. You'll be cleansed. If you are not in Christ, you will be cut off. And you got to be thinking about the husbandman, the vine dresser, the father. You know, that's what a vine dresser does. He goes down the aisle between the grapes, <clears throat> between the vines, and he looks at his product. And he says, maybe these leaves need to be pruned a little bit. These dead leaves need to be peeled off. And uh, my wife is like a really extraordinary gardener regarding flowers. I mean, it, our yard right now in about a week or two is going to look like Mr. Miyagi's backyard in Karate Kid. I mean, we got the fountains, we've got the flowers, we got the bugs, we got it all. You know, I mean, the only thing we're missing is a dojo, and I, I want that badly so I can get in there and do some crane kicks. But, but uh, you know, that's what you do with dead flowers, right? You, you take the petals off, you cut the dead part off. Uh, you can often uproot one and put it in better soil. And, and this is what the Bible talks about with regard to the parable of the soils, right? Some, some bear fruit, and it's, it's kind of temporary. Uh, and, and, you know, the birds come, and the sun scorches, and, you know, the weeds choke it out. But the ones that bear fruit, you know, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 5,000, 30,000, 100,000 fold, I'm ad living there. That is of the Lord, because he who began a good work in you is faithful and just to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't it awesome that God wants to cleanse you? I mean, that'd be a horrible thing if God, like, like if you got saved and God says, well, you're on your own now. Good luck. I'm going to leave you to yourself. I'm going to leave you by yourself. No, the Lord says, I, I'm going to prune you. I'm going to cleanse you, purify you. I'm going to take care of you the rest of your life. Don't think for one second that it was you taking care of yourself all of these days. The Lord sustains you. The Bible says your very next breath comes from him. He upholds all things by the word of his power. That's our king. That's our savior. And he loves us enough to cleanse us. You see, uh, a lot of people think that coming in Christ, they, they don't, they don't want to change. I got to drop this vice. I got to start doing some new things. I got to be with those crazy church people. I don't want to be over there. But what they don't realize, you know, they'll say, well, God loves me just the way I am. He does love you just the way you are, but he doesn't want you to stay that way. He doesn't want to keep you that way. He wants you to grow as a Christian. You know, there are such things as baby Christians. That's why Paul talks about feeding on the meat. Don't just drink milk the rest of your life as a Christian. You need to chew on the meat. You need to graduate to greater things here, you know? 
Now, some people look at this and they say, well, this seems to me that a person, you know, can, can lose their salvation, that they're part of it, and now they're not part of it, now they're thrown into the fire. But remember what Luke said in 8.13. Jesus said, this seed in the soil represented those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. I think what Jesus is getting at here is he's talking about the Christian who's only a Christian externally, like maybe somebody who's part of the church, but not the church. And, and you know a lot of people like that. I know a lot of people like that. I, you know, I hear, I hear this, you know, uh, you know, a lot in the church. And I, I, here's another teaching moment. I told you you're going to warm up and we're just getting started. I, I, this is crazy. Uh, you know, I was asked once by somebody, well, you know, Pastor Barry, uh, I pray the sinner's prayer. Does that mean that I can never be lost? And you may be surprised what, what I told him. I, was, I would say to people like that, no, that doesn't mean you can never be lost. Because, hear me carefully, because nobody is saved by simply saying a prayer. Nobody is saved by simply saying the sinner's prayer. What? Nobody is saved by simply saying the sinner's prayer unless you have prayed in true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, nobody was ever saved by a profession of faith, but a possession of faith. Judas Iscariot, folks. Judas Iscariot. Boy, that brother had a nice profession of faith. He was faithful with the money of the Lord, handling the bag. Of course he was handling the bag because he was saying two for me and one for Jesus. Two in my pocket, one for him. What actually saves you? It is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I can tell you, I don't remember what I prayed in as, as an 11-year-old, but I can, I, was, I can tell you right now, I surrendered my life to Jesus in faith on that day. I did not believe it was a magic prayer. I didn't believe in you know, our church had green carpet. What color did y'all have? Yellow, that 70s retro yellow, that red. Remember that blood red stuff? I mean, you talk about people getting saved, reminding them of hell. And so they were like, I'm getting saved. You know? I don't remember what I prayed except for, Lord, I, save me from my sin. Save me from hell. Lord, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. It's, save me. Well, Pastor Barry, you know, uh, you know, no, church membership doesn't save you. We get to be members. Non-membership doesn't save you. You get to be members. See, we're part of the church because this is where the central work of the Lord Jesus Christ happens. This is like an epicenter, right? The church is an epicenter. It's a hospital for sick people. It is a military place for training. It is an educational place for learning in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is so many things the church is. It is the bride of Christ. And nobody talks about mama. That's just the way it works with the Lord. And Jesus says, you need to believe in him. Produce much fruit. The good news is he says to these folks, you're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. So therefore, abide in 
me. And, and I got to tell you this, what he's saying there is th there, there are degrees of growth. I mean, can we just kind of just call a spade a spade, as my mother-in-law likes to say? Anybody ever heard her say that in Bible study? And all the women are like, yeah, amen. She does this with her hand. She chops. Chop, chop. We call her pearl because she drops pearls. Right, Opa? She drops pearls. And she chop chops, right, Opa? But we got to call a spade a spade. There are more mature Christians. There, there are mature Christians and immature Christians. That's why we have to grow. I mean, some people, it, it baffles me that some people like want to go back to high school. That's like purgatory for Christians or something. Like, I don't want to go back to high school. I mean, I had a good high school experience, but man, I do not want to go back to high school. Do you want to go back to high school? Some people live like they want to go back to high school or junior high. I mean, some adults argue like junior high kids. All you got to do is look on Facebook. And I'm, I mean, it sounds braggadocia, but it's just preacher talk to saying we got we to grow in the Lord. We've got to mature in the Lord, take advantage of the means of grace that God has given us. And, and you know, you're going to hear it here in uh, in Mountain Home, especially there we go. Now I can, yeah, you can hear me now. You're gonna hear it in Mountain Home. I'm gonna, I can worship God in the woods, Brother Barry. I can worship God on the lake. Yes, you can. But I like the illustration of an old preacher once who said, you know, you can be a Christian apart from the church and out on the lake in that sense. He said, but hey, do you want? Do you mind coming over here with me real quick while I cook these burgers? And he was cooking the burgers. And he took a coal from the middle and he put it to the corner of the grill. And he said, you see that coal right there? When it was in the center and the epicenter of God's will there, it was white hot. It was white hot. But you as a Lone Ranger Christian are over here on the side. And if you put that coal on the side, you're going to get nice and cold and eventually you're going to be useless. That coal is going to be useless. So you need to get back into the center of that thing and get white hot for the Lord Jesus Christ in the epicenter of his family called the church. And I think the old boy got the idea. And then John goes on to say, if anyone does not abide in me in six, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branch, branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, burned, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so have I also, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. You see, folks, there are benefits to abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ, one of which is answered prayer. Answered prayer according to everything in his name. Some of you have been praying as that persistent mother for your children for years to get saved. Don't quit. Some of you have prayed to pull your kids out of terrible situations. Don't quit. Some of you have prayed to be used by the Lord in a mighty way. Don't quit. Keep praying according to the will of the Lord, his will on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah, you can, I'm not going to, we're not going to get mad if you pray for the red Lamborghini or a fat Roth IRA. But God is not obligated to give you that. You, you, you may just be wasting your breath. I don't see, I don't think God's going to sit there and strike you dead if you pray for a better car. But God says through Jesus, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask for what you will in my name. We, we've, had, we've had people 
who are older in our church, who were not married, widowed, who prayed for a spouse, and guess what? They got a spouse. It shocked me as much as anybody. Next thing I know, I'm doing senior adult weddings in our church, which is awesome. They have been praying a long time, or maybe they weren't praying, and God, you know, said, I got a prayer request coming your way. It happens. Don't give up on your kids. Don't give up on our community. Don't give up on our nation. Don't give up on the truth. Keep praying. Whatever you're going through, keep praying. Be the the widow, the, the individual, the lone ranger, if you will, in that sense, in your prayer closet, banging on the door. As Charles Spurgeon said, ringing the rope that's connected to the bell and the belfry of God. Keep ringing the bell. And in due time, he will answer. He's an 11th hour God. He's always on time. He's never early or late. He's always right on time. Keep ringing the bell. That's a benefit of following and abiding in Christ. Another benefit is, is the very joy of Christ. This is how some people come to know the Lord. They see the joy in the Christian and they say, there's something different about you. I want that. I want that. How do I get that? And you tell them, you, like the Ethiopian eunuch, what prevents me from being baptized? You know, when Philip says, believing in Jesus, next thing you know, the guy's getting wet. He obviously was reading about the suffering servant in Isaiah. And he said, who is this guy that's suffering? Is he talking about himself or somebody else? And he said, he's talking about Jesus Christ. Do you know him today? Boom. Guy goes public with his faith. The rest is history. That kind of contagion is what the church needs. The worst thing in the world is to have a church full of curmudgeons curmudgeons. They are cranky about everything. They complain about everything. They argue about everything. They think it's their way or the highway. They think it's, this is my church. And I'm thinking, you don't know your Bible very well. This is Jesus church first. This is Jesus church first. And you're second, you're grafted in by grace. You made it by the skin of the cross. And so we all ought to have that kind of life marked by joy. Yes, Jesus was a man of sorrow and acquainted with much grief. But the Bible says that who for the joy set before him endured the cross. That's one of the greatest compliments people have, somebody has ever given me. Not that you're the best preacher. Not that you're the most eloquent. Not that you're most intelligent or theological or blah, blah, blah. The greatest thing someone has said to me is, man, you, you got a lot of joy in Christ, don't you? And I, I do. I have a lot of sorrow as well. It's, it's a mixed bag. But the joy of the Lord is my strength. We got to get back to that. As Martin Lloyd-Jones says, and we got to love the Lord with that kind of joy. But he also says we got to love one another. In 12 and following, I didn't want to cover this, but this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever, where, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I commanded you so that you will love one another. I gotta be honest. It's one thing to love God, but that's a stretch when he asked me to love y'all. I'm sure you feel the same about me. I'm not going to lie. It takes a special supernatural ability from God to love some people. It does. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, you know what? Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. He's telling these guys, listen, 
y'all, y'all were in, y'all were enrolled in my rabbi school of Jesus, if you will. He said, I've been your professor. You've been my subordinates, but today is graduation day. I don't call you students any longer. I call you my friends. And you know he's the best of friends because he says greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Sacrificial love is the greatest kind of love. It's the mother that jumps on the alligator that, and bites his eye when the gator grabs the baby and tries to take the baby into the lake while the dad's looking for the shotgun. It's the dad that jumps in front of the Mack truck and grabs the kid and yanks their arm and it hurts the arm to get yanked, but he saves the kid's life from getting smacked by the truck. Greater love has no one than to lay down his life for his friends. And boy, Jesus demonstrated that. Dying on the cross, being buried and risen again. A lot of you are around. Remember old Chuck Colson, prison ministries? Charles Colson uh, was speaking at an Ivy League school. And it's, it's funny because they were, they were boycotting him when he was speaking. And this person interrupted his speech. And they looked at him and they yelled at him, you know, Chuck Colson. And they said, how could you have defended Richard Nixon? And Chuck Colson said, I defended him because he was my friend. He was my friend. And boy, the room got quiet after that. Because that's what a true friend does. A true friend lays down their life for others. A true friend cries with others when they need to cry. A true friend mourns with others when others mourn. A true friend rejoices when others rejoice. When your kids win, I win. When you win, I win. When you lose, I lose. When you mourn, I mourn. That's how it's supposed to be as Christians. Boy, can you imagine a movement like that in Mountain Home where people actually loved each other? Where people actually, you know, you know, held the line for truth for sure. I think I've given you some pretty good truth, hardcore truth today. But you, they know that you love them and you care about them. And there is a reciprocal effect here. Jesus says, let me, let me tell you why and how this is even possible. He said, because you didn't choose me. It's not like God said, you know, I really need those people on my team. I really need these people in my family because I'm just so, I'm just so lonely. For some reason, I believed that as a kid. I felt like God created Adam and Eve because he was just lonely and wanted to have friends, you know, as if the Trinity wasn't enough for him. Let me tell you why that's important in bearing fruit and loving one another with the joy of Christ. Because, and this, this is probably the best thing you'll get out of this today. It's the kind of sacrificial love that I know a little bit about this, that chooses the orphan and makes them a son or daughter when they could not choose you. My beautiful princess hates it when I talk about her in sermons. She doesn't like that laser on her. But you can learn a lot through her and through others who have adopted She didn't really have much of a choice. It's kind of a false choice. It was us or the streets or something else. You see, this is the kind of love that Ezekiel talks about that sees the individual, the child in the field, muddied up, broken, 
beaten, abused. And Ezekiel said that God picks up this child, cleans and washes this child clean, this young person, puts, puts a ring of, of ownership in her nose. That was a sign of ownership. And he lavishes his grace on that child. And he says, what is mine is yours and you are mine. And all the benefits I have as God are now yours. I'm going to open up the cauldron of heaven and do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ask or imagine. That is sacrificial love. Jesus taking the hit and giving you all of his benefits as the true vine of Israel so that, so that you could grow and bear fruit as the vine dresser lavishes his grace on you and prunes you and beautifies you over your Christian life. This is the God who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light according to the kind will of the Father through the Son and the Spirit of Christ, the kind of love that gives birth to a new family. A new family. You don't have to be Hezbollah. You don't have to be Hamas. You don't have to be Israeli. You have to be in Christ. And there are going to be so many people and so many different kinds of people in heaven. You're, as far as the eye can see, you're not, you're not going to be able to comprehend it. It's going to be the most wildly diverse family ever in heaven. Do you know him that way? Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning ready to sing back some songs to you to give our tithes and offerings. Lord, we pray that you would just bless this time, the remaining minutes ahead, that uh, you will draw people to yourself. Lord, and if there is anybody here that doesn't know you, may they surrender in faith right now according to the power of the Holy Spirit, according to your will on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. We want to align our wills with yours. We thank you for this church. We thank you for these people, for those watching online. And we pray that wherever they are, whatever they're going through, that the joy of the Lord would be their strength. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.